Hey, 5A. Right, we are going to continue with the uh, next chapter of uh, Howl's Moving Castle. If you remember the last time that the uh, uh, Sophie had been off to see the king and that she had uh, tried to uh, talk him out of hiring Howl unsuccessfully and she met the Witch of the Waste and the Witch of the Waste uh, had, uh, killed Mrs. Penstemon, Howl's old magic teacher. So, where are we? Let's have a look. Mm. Right, this is chapter 14, in which a royal wizard catches a cold. Sophie rode back to the castle's Kingsbury entrance in one of the king's coaches drawn by four horses. On it also were a coachman, a groom and a footman. A sergeant and six royal troopers went with it to guard it. The reason was Princess Valeria. She climbed into Sophie's lap. As the coach clattered the short way downhill, Sophie's dress was still covered with the wet marks of Valeria's royal approval. Sophie smiled a little. She thought Marta might have a point after all wanting children, although ten Valerias struck her as a bit much. As Valeria had scrambled over her, Sophie remembered hearing that the witch had threatened in some way, and she found herself saying to Valeria, The witch shan't hurt you. I won't let her. The king had not said anything about that. But he had ordered a, a royal coach for Sophie. The equipage drew to a very noisy halt outside the disguised stable. Michael shot out of the door and got in the way of the footman who was helping Sophie down. Where did you get to, he said. I've been so worried, and Howell's terribly upset. I'm sure he is, Sophie said apprehensively. Because Mrs Penstemon's dead, said Michael. Howell came to the door too. He looked pale and depressed. He was holding a scroll with red and blue royal seals dangling off it, which Sophie eyed guiltily. Howell gave the sergeant a gold piece and did not say a word until the coach and the troopers had gone clattering away. Then he said... I make that four horses and ten men just to get rid of old one old woman. What did you do to the king? Sophie followed Howell and Michael indoors, expecting to find the room covered with green slime. But it wasn't, and there was Calcifer flaring up the chimney, grinning his purple grin. Sophie sank into the, into the, into the chair. I think the king got sick of me turning up and blackening your name. I went twice, she said. Everything went wrong. And I met the witch, on her way from killing Mrs. Pence Stemmon. What a day! While Sophie described some of what had happened, Howe leaned on the mantelpiece, dangling the scroll as if he was thinking of feeding it to Calcifer. Behold the new royal magician, new royal wizard, he said. My name is Very Black. Then he began to laugh, much to the surprise of Sophie. And what did she do to the Count of Cataract, he laughed. I should never have let her near the king. I did blacken your name, Sophie protested. I know, it was my miscalculation, Hal said. Now, how am I going to go to poor Mrs. Pentstemon's funeral without the witch knowing? Any ideas, Calcifer? It was clear that Hal was far more upset about Miss Pentstemon than anything else. Michael was the one who worried about the witch. He confessed next morning that he'd had nightmares all night. He dreamed she came through all the castle entrance at once. Where's Howell? he asked anxiously. Howell had gone, on, gone out very early, leaving the bathroom full of the usual scented steam. He'd not taken his guitar and the doorknob was turned green down. Even Calcifer knew, knew no more than that. Don't open the door to anyone, Calcifer said. The witch knows about all our entrances except the Port Haven one. This so alarmed Michael he got some planks from the yard and wedged them crosswise over the door. Then he, got, then he got to work at last on the spell they'd got back from Miss Angorian. Half an hour later, the doorknob turned sharply to black down. The door began to bounce about. Michael clutched at Sophie. Don't be afraid, he said shakily. I'll keep you safe. The door bounced powerfully for a while, and then it stopped. Michael had just let go of Sophie in great relief when there came a violent explosion. Calcifer plunged to the bottom of the grate and Michael plunged into the broom cupboard, 
leaving Sophie standing there as the door burst open and Hal stormed in. This is a bit much, Sophie, he said. I do live here. He was soaking wet. The grey and scarlet suit was black and brown. His sleeves and the end of his hair were dripping. Sophie looked at the doorknob, still turned to black and brown. Miss Angorian, she thought. And he went to see her in, his, in, his, in that charmed suit. Where have you been? she said. Hal sneezed. Standing in the rain. None of your business, he said hoarsely. And what were those planks in aid of? I did them, Michael said, edging out of the broom cupboard. The witch, you must think I don't know my business, Hal said irritably. I have so many misdirection spells out that most people wouldn't find us at all. I gave even the witch three days. <sighs> Calcifer, I need a hot drink. Calcifer had been climbing up among his logs, but as Hal went over to the fireplace, he plunged down again. Don't come near me like that. You're wet, he hissed. Sophie, Hal said pleasing, pleadingly. Sophie folded her arms pitilessly. What about Letty? She said. I'm soaked through, said Hal. I should have a hot drink. And I said, what about Letty Hatter? Sophie said. Bother you then, said Hal. And he shook himself. The water fell off him in a neat ring on the floor. And Hal stepped out of it with his hair gleaming dry and his suit grey and scarlet and not even damp and went to fetch the saucepan. The world is full of hard-hearted women, Michael, he said. I can name three without stopping to think. Hmm. One of them being Miss Angorian, asked Sophie. Hal didn't answer. He ignored Sophie grandly for the, next, for the rest of the morning, while he discussed moving the castle with Michael and Calcifer. Hal really was just going to run away, just as she'd warned the king he would, Sophie thought, as she sat and sewed more triangles of blue and silver suit together. She knew she must get Hal out of that grey and scarlet suit as soon as possible. I don't think we need to move the Port Haven entrance, Hal said. He conjured himself a handkerchief out of the air and blew his nose with a hoot which made Calcifer flicker uneasily. But I, but I want the moving castle when, well away from anywhere it's been before, and the Kingsbury entrance shut down. Someone knocked on the door then. Sophie noticed that Hal jumped and looked around as nervously as Michael. Neither of them answered the door. Coward, Sophie thought scornfully. She wondered why she'd gone through all that trouble for Hal yesterday. I must have been mad, she muttered to the blue and silver suit. What about the black down entrance? Michael asked, when the person knocking seemed to have gone away. Oh, that stays, Hal said, and conjured himself another handkerchief with a final sort of flick. Yes, it would stay, Sophie thought. Miss Angorian is outside it. Poor Letty. By the middle of the morning, Hal was conjuring handkerchiefs in twos and threes. They were floppy squares of paper, really, Sophie saw. He kept sneezing. His voice grew hoarser. He was conjuring handkerchiefs by the half dozen soon. Ashes from the used ones were piled all around Calcifer. Oh, why is it whenever I go to Wales I always come back with a cold? Hal croaked and conjured himself a whole wad of tissues. Sophie snorted. Did you say something? Hal croaked. No. But I was thinking, people who run away from everything deserve every cold they get, Sophie said. People who are appointed to do something by the king and go courting in the rain instead only have themselves to blame. You don't know everything I do, Miss Moraliser, said Hal. Want me to write out a list before I go another time? I have looked for Prince Justin. Prince Justin. Courting isn't the only thing I do when I go out. When have you looked, said Sophie. Oh. How your ears flap and your long nose twitches, Hal croaked. I looked when he first disappeared, of course. I was curious to know what Prince Justin was doing up this way, when everyone knew Solomon had gone to the waste. I think somebody must have sold him a dud finding spell, because he went right over in the Folding Valley and bought another from Miss Fairfax. And that fetched him back this way, fairly naturally, where he stopped at the castle and Michael sold him another finding and disguise spell. Michael's hand went over his mouth. <gasps> Was that the man in the green uniform, Prince Justin? Yes, but I didn't mention the matter before, said Hal. The king might have thought you had the sense to sell him another dud. 
I had a conscience about it. Conscience. Notice that word, Miss Longnose. I had a conscience. Hal conjured another wad of handkerchiefs and glowered at Sophie over them, out of eyes that were now red-rimmed and watery. Then he stood up. I feel ill, he announced. I'm going to bed where I may die. He tottered piteously to the stairs. Bury me behind Miss Pentstemon, he croaked as he went up them to the bed. Sophie applied herself to her sewing harder than ever. Here was her chance to get the grey and scarlet suit off Hal before it did more damage to Miss Angorian's heart. Unless, of course, Hal went to bed in his clothes, which she did not put past him. So Hal must have been looking for Prince Justin when he went to Upper Folding and met Letty. Poor Letty, Sophie thought, putting brisk tiny stitches in her 57th blue triangle. Only another 40 or so to go. Hal's voice was presently heard shouting weakly, Help me someone, I'm dying from neglect up here. Sophie snorted. Michael left off working on his new spell and ran up and down stairs. Things became very restless. In the time it took Sophie to sew ten more blue triangles, Michael ran upstairs with lemon and honey, with a particular book, with cough mixture, a spoon to take the cough mixture, then nose drops, throat pastels, gargle, pen, paper, three more books, and an infusion of willow bark. People kept knocking at the door too, making Sophie jump and calcifer flicker usually, uneasily. When no one opened the door, some of the people went on hammering for five minutes or so, rightly thinking they were being ignored. By this time, Sophie was becoming worried about the blue and silver suit. It was getting smaller and smaller. You can't sew in, in that number of triangles without take, taking up quite a lot of cloth in the seams. Michael, she said, when Michael came rushing downstairs again, because Hal fancied a bacon sandwich for lunch. Michael, is there a way of making small clothes larger? Oh yes, said Michael, that's just what my new spell is, when I get the chance to work on it. He wants six slices of bacon in the sandwich, could you ask Calcifer? Sophie and Calcifer ex exchanged speaking looks. I don't think he's dying, Calcifer said. I'll give you one of the bacon rinds to eat if you bend your head down, Sophie said, laying down her sewing. It was easier to bribe Calcifer than to bully him. They had bacon sandwiches for lunch but Michael had to rush upstairs in the middle of eating his. He came down with the news that Hal wanted him to go into market chipping and get some things he needed for moving the castle. But, but the witch, is it safe? Sophie asked. Michael licked bacon grease off his fingers and dived into the broom cupboard. He came out with one of the dusty, dusty velvet cloaks slung around his shoulders. At last, the person who came out wearing the cloak was a burly man with a red beard. This person licked his fingers and said, with Michael's voice, Hal thinks I'll be safe enough like this. It's misdirection as well as disguise. I wonder if Letty will know me. The burly man opened the door, greened down and jumped out onto the slowly moving hills. Peace descended. Calcifer settled and chinked. Hal had evidently realised that Sophie was not going to run about after him. There was silence upstairs. Sophie got up and cautiously hobbled to the broom cupboard. This was her chance to go and see Letty. Letty must be very miserable by now. Sophie was fairly sure Howell hadn't been near her since that day in the orchard. It might just do some good if Sophie were to tell her that her feelings were caused by a charmed suit. Anyway, she owed it to Letty to tell her. The seven league boots were not in the cupboard. Sophie could not believe it at first. She turned everything out, and there was nothing there but ordinary buckets, brooms and the other velvet cloak. Drat that man, Sophie exclaimed. Sorry, I've just got slightly distracted here. I'll continue this later.